gentlemen, before I start the Q&A, I just want to mention that Professor Lamont's book is called Consciousness Beyond Life, and you can buy it at any university book, bookstore or uh, toys or uh, your quarter store. We tried getting copies here, but then I think the bookstore was closed on Thursday in time. So it's called Consciousness Beyond Life, Science of Near-Life Experience. Well, it's an open forum. You can start asking questions. Just put your hand up. Can we start? Can I start with a question to the audience? How many of you know someone who had a near-death experience? How many of you had a near-death experience themselves? I'm not sure. Is someone willing to share this experience with us? Yes, you will. I would just share Yeah? I would just say I had a very vivid experience about 25 years ago and repeated uh, six months later again and again the third time and now the six months which is the most intense on the three and I've never had it since which was just, just like a, a beautiful dream and I've been like this the whole day following and it lasted into the second day, it was fading, gone by the end of the second day. We had the most amazing feeling of bliss all that first day, and say, Trace of the second day, which I've never experienced before. Walking in the garden, in the dark, almost before dawn, and the field dawn was about to break, and there was this feeling like of growth bursting, and you could feel vibrating for This is the feeling I had, I was walking slowly up and down the garden, with that peas growing on, on canes, and all this green in the, in the dim, very dim light, and this wonderful feeling, and this happiness lasted all day. You should come and go and stay in the to come again. It was absolutely wonderful. Are you afraid of death? I am afraid, uh, to some extent, because that's so uh, I don't think it was a dream. It was a period of enhanced consciousness. <coughs> somebody, thank you. Somebody said to me, I walked through the land of the uh, uh, spirit. Yes, it's an enhanced consciousness, it's not a dream. I have a last question, and then you can ask. How many of you have had sometimes the inner knowing or feeling that to be in contact with a diseased relative? Thank you. Thank you. Also, taboo would never. It's hard to talk about it as well. Thank you. Questions? Yes. We are very impressed with the presentation that you made, which was very balanced and very scientifically oriented. The one issue that kind of has been bothering this kind of scientific community is that why can't we do an experiment whereby if a person is floating about the body, they'll be able to see a special sign or a symbol that we kind of hide about the operating pressure, and then he can report it. Then it will be like a you know conclusive evidence of near death experience. What is your experience? Yeah. Thank you. The question is, uh, there have been put hidden targets of hidden signs in close to the ceiling in resuscitation rooms and operation rooms, and I hope that, that there could be an objective proof that people were out of the body. And as I mentioned in my lecture, there has been a review of 93 cases where veridical perception was corroborated by researchers, and 90% was totally correct. This, for me, is already a proof. It's an objective corroboration. But the question is, also now the AWARE study was sent by doing so that in other uh, hospitals in England. And uh, we had also, uh, in one resuscitation room, hidden targets close to the ceiling. <coughs> and also uh, penisotory here in England. There has never been one patient who had an out-of-body experience who saw this hidden sign. And even Penny Sartori had a patient who could describe into detail what happened to his body during resuscitation, but he didn't see this hidden sign. Now, why is it? What we perceive also now, conscious perceive in our today, in a daily work consciousness, is depending on our intention and attention. We don't perceive, we miss things if we're not at intention. When you drive home, and I drive behind you and I see 
trees or a house or a cow or whatever, and I ask you when you arrive, oh, did you see that and that and that? And you say, no, then I say, I can scientifically prove that you were not on the road. <laughs> Any total nonsense. Because you're not consciously there. Um, so the problem is that when you're out of your body during res resuscitation, and you are so surprised to see your life and body, people resuscitating you, or you think of your family, you're there with your family. You don't start looking around if there is a hidden sign, if you talk to And that's, for me, the, and it's called inattentional blindness. Inattentional blindness, there have been a lot of uh, uh, things about it, articles about it, and one of the main things is that there's a small film they show to, to, to people, also for psychology students. And then you see baseball, people playing baseball, and they are, they're asked, look, especially what's going on, how, when, who is playing, etc. And people are watching, and then in the middle of the film, someone dressed as a gorilla is there. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody sees it. Nobody. And even the second time, a lot of people are missing it, because they're just looking at where the goal goes, etc. So this is called inattentional writing. And that's, for me, the explanation why the hidden target is and will not be perceived as well. And for the skeptic, it's a problem. Um, they want to have objective proof, and I don't think there is objective proof except the corroborated cases of theoretical perception about what happened and at what moment during the situation, during unconsciousness. Thank you for the question. You have to put a sign saying, Jim Smith, phone your mom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the problem is that then nurses can, nurses can see it as well or know it, and then perhaps if they have the feeling they know that the nurse has seen it. So there must be a sign that no physician or nurse knows that. So they also have laptops with each minute changing signs just to do it as objective as possible. So it must, nobody must know it. In Holland, where, where I did it in the house, I did know that one of my colleagues had put a sign. I, did, I still don't know what he did. That's the only way to do it. Yes? Um, I been a lot of theories like this, based on research sectors but studies, with the selection of patients. And what we did is, in our prospective study, see if there is an explanation, a physiological explanation, like of oxygen, or which means also that there can be a boost of hormones, of neuropeptides going free in the, in the brain. But there was no explanation whatsoever that an oxygen, like oxygen in the brain, was an explanation why only 80% of the people had this experience, while 100% had an oxygen of the brain. Besides, people who have depression, Sufis in meditation, patients in isolation, Lindbergh flying over the ocean, Glenn, or, or, or had it in the, in the capsule in, in somewhere outside the earth. Uh, people lost in the desert, shipwrecks, have the same experience. Existential crisis have the same experience. And there is no, which was an explanation, is no anoxia of the brain. People have said that the feeling of happiness is because of endorphins in the brain. And then you lose also your pain experience. But the problem is that this effect of endorphins takes hours. When people are returned into the body, Contrary to at that very moment, they have again the pain of the body, the traffic accident, or the pain of the cardiac arrest, of the, the, the myocardial function. So there is no physiological explanation whatsoever. And everything in my book have all the theories that has been said and written down. I explain why they've said it and why they're, true, they're false. Okay? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, uh, one, uh, so uh, uh, returning to the body doesn't mean to go back into the body. 
It means using the body. Using the body as instrument. Because endless consciousness is not located into the body. It is a new located reality all the time. With the body or without the body, it is no located reality. Sometimes it is using the body when the body is usable, when it is alive. And sometimes it stops using the body when it is useless. Or you asleep. Or you asleep. Or you are asleep. I think we, we, we have to had uh, a couple of uh, wonderful presentations uh, on this elevated, elevated uh, experience of consciousness. Um, uh, but you know, uh, uh, it has to be said, you know, what you're presenting, despite all the evidence that you're uh, giving, they are based on personal experiences. And you, even if you look at, you know, historically, ancient times, different cultures, all the experiences people have talked about, they are personal. Um, and here, you know, we are trying to bridge a gap or maybe excite the, you know, scientific uh, community, which tends to be more <coughs> impersonal. So I'm looking for whether, you know, you think, you know, that's ever going to be possible to look at this subject in an impersonal manner and come up with some, you know, something more concrete. Yeah, the, the problem is that in our current materialistic science, consciousness does not exist because you cannot prove it. The only thing we know is that we are conscious. <laughs> and that's the problem. The most intimate thing we know is our consciousness. And no scientist can prove that you are conscious what you are thinking, what you are feeling. So our materialistic science is not fit for consciousness. You can have conscious, you can have scientific methodology, like the empirical studies we did on chronic arrest. And you have to accept subjectivity included into science, what I call inclusive science. So you have to include all the subjective aspects as well. A part of our study was objective, that is the transformational effects. So we had interviews after two years and eight years, and the objective aspects was the transformation was only in patients who had told us that they had an inactive experience. The <coughs> people who did not have an inactive experience had not this kind of transformation. And this studies on transformation was with a lot of psychological tests and, 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 and questions, the questionnaires. So this is the objective part. But as long as we just not talk about scientific methodology, but about materialistic science, we cannot discuss consciousness at all. And that's a problem in this time. While it is still the essence of who we are. Yeah, if I may. So I'm, I'm very sympathetic to your, to your concepts, to both of your concepts on the general consciousness. One of the points, though, um, uh, if my and a non-local consciousness. But and to use your analogy, maybe this is the limits of the analogy, if my consciousness manifests itself in the radio on station one and my body dies, let's call it the radio being destroyed. And my consciousness, unless you believe in reincarnation, channel one is lost. Right? Channel one is lost forever. Uh, that means your personal aspect, your ego, your waking consciousness. And by my consciousness, I, I, if I take your, if I accept yeah. your thesis, my channel consciousness goes on beyond that. But it will never be accessed. It's channel one will be on. The access and as a consequence then yeah. through my life then, should I care about what happens to my consciousness beyond that point? Because yeah. at the end of my 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 radio being destroyed, die. There's, there's no more for me to worry about. Well, that's what I'm trying to explain, that each thought you had during your life is kept, also with the influence of others. Each act or word you said 